Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I hope those of you who had time to get something neat did so. Um, if you, there'll still be food left over after we're done. If you want to have some, I expect, and I know there'll be treats back there. So we welcome you to stay after church for a while and visit. Uh, I have just a couple of brief announcements myself to make with you. The, in, on Wednesdays now in the morning at 8.30, I've returned to, oh, okay, I'll turn it on. I've returned to coffee with the pastor um, down at the CAF on 3rd Avenue. And so you, anyone's invited to that. I get there at 8.30, there till about 10. And we have breakfast and coffee and talk. So anybody would like to drop by, we welcome you to that. It's also online on Facebook, but that's a different thing altogether. That's just a little update. I'm going to continue to do that. Um, today we've got uh, the flowers that are um, up here in front now came from Helga Bob from her gar very garden. So we have some little bit of sunshine and springtime that she brought in this morning. We want to thank her for that. Let's see, that's about all I've got, but we have something special to, have, uh, to talk about today. Today, we have got visiting with us, Lori Allen and her husband <laughs> are here, and she is the uh, executive director for uh, Habitat for Humanity. And so she's gonna come and talk to us a little bit about that, and I'm gonna get her PowerPoint ready while she gets set. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, just wanted to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. It's a, it's a wonderful um, day to celebrate all the wonderful things that all the mothers do. So enjoy your day and thank you for having me. And also thank you for all your support. I know that all of you um, in this congregation and membership have definitely supported Door County Habitat over the last year and I wanna personally thank you for that. So I, I want to tell you some exciting news so you know what's going on in the habitat world in Door County. Um, for the first 10 years, or the last 10 years, we have only been building one home. Um, but I've started in, I've been here two years now, and so my goal was to be able to build more than one home per year. So last year we built two homes, and this coming week next week we're going to be breaking ground for two more homes so just excited about the opportunity to be able to serve families here in door county we all know what a housing crisis we're in and so anything that we can do to help families with home repairs um, construction and then we were also donated a property in algoma which was a dentist office and it's now zoned for housing and we're gonna be doing a rehab. Um, we're gonna be gutting the whole house and that'll be a two family. Um, there's a single mom and a disabled daughter that will probably be living in that home. So keep us in your thoughts and prayers. Um, we're excited about this year and our builds. And later I'll talk to you about how you can get involved if you'd like. So we'll go ahead and get started. So Habitat uh, for Humanity's international mission is, is seeking to put God's love into action, right? And how do we do that? We bring people together to build homes and communities and home repairs. Um, our vision is a world where everyone has a decent place to live. Door County Habitat for Humanity's mission and vision is a Christian organization striving to provide all who are participate with us opportunities to further grow into all God's intents. We act in partnership with our community to extend a hand up to help others acquire and own decent and affordable housing. Our vision is to become a community where everybody has a decent place to live. Just a little bit about um, uh, Habitat for Humanity International. A lot of people think that Habitat International provides all of our monetary support. That is, is not true at all. Um, we do have opportunities to apply for federal grants through International, but we really do all of our fundraising and all of our revenue right here in Door County. And that's why it's so important and how much we appreciate our, appreciate our community partnerships because otherwise we wouldn't survive. Um, we wouldn't be able to build two homes. We wouldn't be able to do a rehab. Um, so please keep that in mind. A lot of people think, you know, International just hands us money to build, build homes, and they don't. 
Um, it was, yeah, perfect. You can go back. Whoops. <laughs> That's okay. I do the same thing. I'm glad he's driving. <laughs> There we go. Um, so Habitat International started in 1976 by Millard and Linda Fuller. A lot of people feel or think that um, Jimmy Carter and his wife started it, but they really were a huge part of it. They worked very closely with Jimmy. Um, and, and I was just at the conference in Atlanta two weeks ago, and it's really neat to see all that Jimmy Carter has done in Atlanta for, for affordable housing. So he's a huge part of that too. Um, simple, decent, affordable homes. Our homes are not extravagant. There's no swimming pool. There's no, um, actually we don't even have a full basement. We do have a crawl space, but it's, I mean, it's very, very well built, but it's really affordable and nothing extravagant. Over 2, 000, 2 million homes built or repaired and our largest private home builder in the United States. So we build more homes um, than, than all the other contractors uh, in the United States. So you can see where we started here in Door County in 1992. And that's when the discussion started to happen like, hey, we wanna start an affiliate here in Door County. And then finally, in 1993, Door County Habitat for Humanity was recognized as an affiliate in uh, Wisconsin. And then in 1994, they built their first home. And now we're jump all the way over to 2022, and we have built um, 45 and four, 44 and 45 were the homes that we just built this last year. So this upcoming year will be 46, which is on Cherry Court behind Dairy Queen. Does everybody know where that is? Yep, it's a, it's, it's a really nice cul-de-sac in the back there that'll all be um, Habitat or um, Housing Partnership homes. And then we have a special family that you might have heard about the last couple weeks is the Wittenmeyer family. And they own their own land in Bailey's Harbor and she is struggling with breast cancer and has a couple months to live. Um, so her husband and two children um, will be building in Bailey's Harbor for them. And again, we're starting groundbreaking next week. Hopefully the weather um, cooperates. Why Door County Habitat for Humanity? Well, like I told you, we have lots of different programs to offer, our home building program, our home repair program. Some of you might have heard about our new program. We have two ramps that cost about $14,000 total um, that are portable. So if someone needs a ramp, they're discharged from the hospital, they have an illness, they broke a leg, and they're having a hard time getting into their home safely, we can come and install a ramp in one day. Now, if we didn't have the metal ramps, we would have to build that, and that usually takes up to a week, and it costs so much more. So we're leasing this ramp. So if you know of anybody that needs a ramp, we still have one available for installation. We have our Restore, the best kept secret. I don't know if any of you shop there, but we get great items. Um, we, I, I get in trouble, I stay, try to stay in my office because there's such great things coming in right now. So please come and check us out. That's a great way to support us, is to shop at the ReStore and to donate items. Um, I talked to you about Ramp Up. I, right now it costs us about $170,000 to build a home, so that's why my job is to do fundraising. So I usually wanna raise between four and five hundred thousand dollars a year. And that's where, again, we appreciate the support from this church. Um, one in nine households in Wisconsin spend over their half of their income in housing. And that's, and, and we know in Door County that there's nowhere to live. Right, we, ha we have vacation rentals that are being bought up. We have families that are here that need to work and really struggle with housing. So that's why we hope to build more and more homes each year. This is a really neat quick video that I would like to share with you on the crisis that we have here in Door County. Oh no. That's okay, uh, if, if you can't watch it now. Mm -hmm. 
I will always leave this presentation, so if you want to watch it at a later date. I think it's working. It's thinking. There we go. The beauty of Door County camouflages the challenges faced by our neighbors and friends trying to live and work here year round. Finding safe, affordable and dignified housing can be overwhelming because very little exists. Recent studies underline this crisis, but have not revealed its impact on the people who struggle to find a place of our own. It is time we hear their voices. When I started searching for housing in Door County, I was expecting it to be relatively easy and um, especially being from here, knowing people, I would have thought that I would find things relatively quickly and that has not been the case at all. I, um, I'm still looking. Let's just put, I'm still looking and I've been living back home now for just over three years. But for pretty much for 10 days I was homeless. I, I lived in a tent <laughs> and pitching a tent often in different places uh, every night and that's the way it went for a while and then I saw an advertisement in the Pulse for a cottage in Sturgeon Bay and uh, I went down and met the owner and said I'll take it on the spot. I think that if you look at places to stay up here you better bring your checkbook because right away I knew you wouldn't get two chances at this. The quality of the housing that those of us um have to resort to due to lower income levels, I have found in the 30 plus years that I've been in Door County is very poor. I don't think from the time I moved in to the time that I left that the heat worked. I could see through the roof and I'd lay down in my bed at night and I could see the sky through the ceiling. Um, and again, mold everywhere. Everywhere you looked, there was mold. Mold everywhere. Um, and I, I ended up living there because it's the only place I could afford for maybe five months, and I got sick. And I said, that's it. Affordable to me would probably mean something that's not gonna break my bank, you know? to where I don't have to have basically four or five jobs to pay my month's rent, you know? Affordable to me would be, you know, six, seven hundred dollars for a two bedroom or even a one bedroom. You know, paying twelve hundred for a two bedroom, that's not affordable living. At least in my, my eyes, my opinion, that who can afford that? In the community we live in up here, which is, as we all know, tourism is one of our, you know, it's a big engine up here. And to have that engine run smoothly, you have to have the people behind the scenes that do the work. And over the many years that I've been here, so often these people do not have a place to live and they actually will turn around and go home. I've seen it happen. If you really care about your community as much as you say that you do, keep an open mind and, and help us work through this problem. Because I'd like to see my friends who are living in their cars in a home. I'd like to see their kids not have to move every six months because there's no year-round housing. And, and that's really the big part is just remember who it is that you're forcing to sleep in a car at night. It's the woman that sells you your prescription. It's the woman that serves you your food when you go out to eat. It's the person who cleans the rooms in the hotel where your family stays. We have, they have faces, they have faces, and I think people forget that. 
Thank you. Pretty powerful um, when it hits home and we talk, we actually see the people talking about the crisis here um, in Door County. So that's why I have a strong passion um, for for what I do. It's it's a part of God's work and just kind of a great video to show you um, the housing crisis. I'm just going to quickly go through these so you can get to your service. Um, home ownership model is that we build the home for the family and they finance it through us with a 0% um, mortgage. So they do not pay any interest and we can do it over 30 years. So it's affordable to them. And then we reinvest their mortgage payments each month into building homes the following year. Um, families have to do, each adult has to do 200 hours of sweat equity. So they have to help build their home, they can help prepare a meal, they can work at the ReStore, um, family and friends can help them get that 200 hours. So it's really not giving them a home, we really call it a hand up, not a handout. So this right here is the Krieger family. They are the ones um, that moved into their new home on North 6th Place in December, and they are super happy. And then this is the Wittenmeyer family that we're gonna be building for in um, Bailey's Harbor. Our family selection committee is very close to naming our partner for the home um, behind Dairy Queen on Cherry Court. That we have a new partnership with the housing um, partnership in here in Door County where the family actually leases the land and they purchase the home from us and that home will always stay in affordable housing. So they, when, if a family chooses to move, they can sell their, we will sell their home, not them. So it stays in affordable housing. That's a new partnership that we have and has really been helpful with lowering the payments for families. You can keep going. Home buy, we have home repair, home buyer program. And housing criteria. Not everybody can just get a house. You have to have a need. You have to have the ability to pay. You have to be willing to be our partner with us. And you also have to be a resident of Door County for 12 months. This is our picture of our groundbreaking last year in Bailey's Harbor. Again, homes aren't given away. They have to do their sweat equity hours. Um, they can do their 20 to, usually 20 to 30 year mortgage and a hand up, not a handout. We're not a welfare program. They have to pay their monthly mortgage and escrow payments. They must have homeowner's insurance and they pay property taxes, just like you and I. Uh, homes are built with quality materials and high construction standards. Actually, this year we were chosen to do a pilot. We're going to be putting in solar panels um, on our houses, and hopefully that'll even make it more efficient. Again, you have to be 18 years old. You have to live in Door County. You have to be in a home that you're renting that's overcrowded or unsafe. Um, you cannot own your own home. You're unable to obtain a conventional home loan. You have to be able to provide $500 down and you have to do your 200 hours per adult in the home for sweat equity. You can go ahead. Um, if you'd like to become a homeowner, you just come and talk to us at the ReStore office and I will help you get set up. We do um, plan on over the next couple of years is increasing our home repair and our home builds can keep going. The ReStore, we need volunteers all the time. You can go ahead, that's what we offer at the ReStore. These are our hours, Monday through Friday, nine to five, Saturday, nine to two. And then if you do need help picking up some donations, we do um, have a small fee for that um, to pick up or deliver. Volunteering, this is where I need all of your help. Um, especially in the next couple months when we start building, if you or your family would love to donate a snack or a lunch or Gatorade or water, 
we would be so happy to do that because we do um, feed our volunteers at 10 o'clock, they, they are looking for their snack, and at noon, they're ready for lunch. So if you can help us, you can call our office, sign up, even if you just bring, they're happy with cookies or ice cream or anything. Um, that certainly will help us in, in keeping our volunteers happy and hydrated during the, the summer. Um, you can volunteer in so many different ways, but really where we're in need right now is um, at the build sites, having meals and snacks, and then also at the restore. Um, just coming in and helping us organize, price things would be awesome. These are types of things that I mentioned that you can help out with for volunteering. Construction, we always need construction volunteers. Our average age of our volunteers are 71. So we need to get some, some new blood in there. They're great workers, but we, we, we gotta be able to replenish them. <laughs> the restore, again, I told you things that you can do to help out there. Fundraising, um, Don Ziegelbauer, I know as a part of your congregation, love him to death. He's a huge supporter for Habitat. Um, he had two or three teams for the Lions Club. We just had our bowl-a-thon. We raised $8,000. It was a great time. Um, we do, if you're, you're a golfer out there and you want to come and golf on August um, 15, 17th, which is a Wednesday, at Idlewild, we have our third annual uh, golf outing coming up, and that's, that's really fun, too. If you don't golf, you can come help us at the event. Uh, there's always, I can always find something for you to do if, if you're interested. Donations, again, we couldn't do it out, we could not do it without this wonderful community. Donating items to the ReStore, donating money to help us continue to build homes, and also help with home repairs that people that can't afford it. Again, ways to donate, cash. Uh, 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 donations of appliances, providing food at the build, construction items, and again, a lot of people have helped us and donated land and a house um, that we can re re repurpose. Upcoming events is our golf outing and our two builds and our rehab. Okay, finally, any questions before I go? I will leave this PowerPoint here. Um, I will leave some flyers if you're interested. Um, God bless all of you. Happy Mother's Day, and thank you for having me today. Okay. This is a little welcome slide for honoring mothers today and Mother's Day, so we're really glad you're here. Those of you who are mothers and grandmothers and everybody, but uh, benefits from motherhood, without a doubt. We're gonna have some hymns of praise to get us going with our worship, and the first one is, Lord, I lift your name up on high. I think it's familiar to us.
Sam. Again, I want to just wish you all a very happy Mother's Day. And I have a prayer I'd like to use on this occasion. It's one I've used pretty much every year for, for Mother's Day. And it seems pretty appropriate, especially after hearing a presentation concerning the issue of, of homes, because a mother makes a home, quite literally, and with, uh, with the understanding of the limitation of housing and the importance of mothers, this comes together for us today. May we pray for our mothers who have given us life and love, that we may show them reverence and love, we pray to the Lord. For mothers who have lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope, and their family and friends support and console them, we pray to the Lord. For women, though without children of their own, who like mothers have nurtured and cared for us, we pray to the Lord. For mothers who have been unable to be a source of strength, who have not responded to their children and have not sustained their families, we pray to the Lord. Loving God, as a mother gives life and nourishment to her children, so you watch over your church. Bless these women that they may be strengthened as Christian mothers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth. Grant that we, their sons and daughters, may honor them always with a spirit of profound respect. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And if you have not yet, ladies, picked up a pen, there's a gift for you. It's just outside the door, right by the entryway to the sanctuary in the fellowship hall. So there's plenty there. We got more in a box. So if you haven't got one, please grab one. If there's extra there and you have a mother at home you'd like to take to, a grandma or somebody like that, take an extra one. That'd be fine. And now we have a very special treat. So Judy's going to come up.
It's a joyful thing that it's Mother's Day, and so we celebrate that with you today. We hope that, again, you had an opportunity to have some treats, um, and there'll be some after the service as well. We do have a concern, uh, many of you may know, Marge Fink suffered a, a health event in her life and uh, has been in the hospital down in uh, Green Bay and will be moved to um, De Pere and unfortunately entered into hospice there. So please keep Robert and family in your prayers, if you would please, as they go through a very difficult, difficult time, needless to say. Uh, I do ask you to, to also look in the bulletin for our prayer list in there. We try to keep that up. Once again, if there's any you would share with us, uh, please contact the office or you can fill out a card back there. Do indicate if it is for us to publicly speak of um, and so that it, we know it's okay to do that as we're recorded. Um, so just... Um, there's different ways to do that. You can either write it down, let us know, and we keep it to ourselves, or you can tell us we can make it public. So let's take a moment uh, for prayer. Uh, I think today of the mothers of my life, my, those, my own mother who is no longer with us, my mother-in-law who is also no longer with us, and the mother of my children back there, Jackie. And we, we should celebrate this, my, my son's wife who has our grandchildren. Uh, these are people who come to my mind and I think about the enormous weight on their shoulders um, that uh, that motherhood represents. Let us pray. Merciful and loving God, every day that we wake up, we face a new day. And for us, it seems as if it is indeed something new, but for you, it is not. You are ever present, ever before us, ever guiding our steps. We pray for the ladies in our lives who lead families and those who are able to do so, those who are finding it very difficult to do so. It, motherhood is under such a challenge in our society today, so bless each and every one of them. Give them the courage to do as they must to care for their children and their families. Give them strength and guidance, we pray. We pray for Marge and, and Robert and family today as she deals with her health issues and for all those among us that are, are struggling with difficult, difficult things related to their health. We hold Don Bork in our prayers too as he, he mourns the loss of his wife, Karen, and their family. We be with, be with them and breathe them peace as well, we pray. There are so many things, God, that we could lift before you today and, and also the joys, the beautiful day that's before us and the, the hope and happiness that that brings to us to see the sun, sun shining, the flowers blooming, and the birds singing. We're grateful for these things. For everything that you give us, O oh God, and show us in your way, we are grateful. And we offer our thanks and praise even as we pray now the prayer that your Son has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven. Once again, we thank the Lord for the gifts given to this church and for the help that it gives us to do the mission we've been called to. May we offer our thanks and prayer. Mighty and loving God, we thank you for the care of this church, for those who support it in so many ways. We thank you for the hands that work so hard to give us a good breakfast or to see the places ready for us to use or runs the office, all the different places, works with the young people and education, so many things. We're so grateful for that, all the volunteers that help make our mission work as well. We thank you and ask for your blessing upon these gifts that are given this church and on those who serve and those who will serve, we pray for as well. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. The first reading this morning is from Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17, from the Good News Translation. <clears throat> the Enormous Crowd. After this I looked, and there was an enormous crowd, 
No one could count all the people. They were from every race, tribe, nation, and language, and they stood in front of the throne of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They called out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God, who sits on the throne, and from the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, the elders and the four living creatures. Then they threw themselves face downward in front of the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, and honor, power, and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. One of the elders asked me, Who are these people dressed in white robes, and where do they come from? I don't know, sir. You do, I answered. He said to me, These are the people who have come safely through the terrible persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. That is why they stand before God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will protect them with his presence. Never again will they hunger or thirst. Neither sun nor scorching heat will burn them. Because the lamb who is the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of giving water, living water, life-giving water, sorry. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The second reading is from John 10, verses 22 through 30, also from the Good News Translation. Jesus is rejected. It was winter, and the festival of the dedication of the temple was being celebrated in Jerusalem. Jesus was walking in Solomon's porch in the temple when the people gathered around him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? Tell us the plain truth. Are you the Messiah? Jesus answered, I have already told you, but you would not believe me. The deeds I do by my Father's authority speak on my behalf, but you will not believe, for you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never die. No one can snatch them away from me. What my Father has given me is greater than everything, and no one can snatch them away from the Father's care. The Father and I are one.
friend of mine some years ago and I were talking about the teachings of the, of the church, doctrine and that kind of thing. And he was a very skeptical individual. And I got along real with, well with him because I had been a very skeptical individual too and had my doubts just like he did. And he said, well, why, why ought I even pay any attention to any of this? Why should I bother? What's it matter to me? I live my life every day just the way I am now, and I'm doing just fine. So how in the world am I supposed to know anything in here is true at all? You hear the echo of what the Scripture passage in John was saying? They wanted some kind of proof. They wanted him to speak plainly, but you see, the thing is about when people speak truth to us, oftentimes we don't hear it because it's not the truth we want to hear. Oftentimes we don't hear what people say when they challenge us because we want something else. We want something that agrees with our thinking, it goes along with where we are in our life, and it is in accord with how we see the world. So when something challenges us, as the Word of God does, sometimes we don't hear it. Because truly, we're not really listening. We're listening, but not for what it always has to say to us, because it always speaks truth, and truth can be a very painful thing to hear. When John, the apostle likely often referred to as John the Divine, had this, this vision that he records in Revelations, you can imagine what he was met with when he spoke to people about that experience. I mean, after all, what is he talking about here? He's talking about a vision of the very place of God in heaven. He's talking about seeing these incredible, miraculous things. This is his truth. And it's very hard to hear, really, because it challenges us, does it not? Are we to think of heaven as being like a throne room with a, with a great throne and all of these angels surrounding it and all these people dressed in white robes singing praises? Those are represented as being those who were brought to heaven who died literally during the great persecution spoken of in Revelations? Is, is that what we're to believe? This reading comes out of Revelations during a period of time that is described as the opening of the scroll. What, what John had seen was a scroll was present in heaven, and an angel has said, is there any worthy to open the scroll sealed with seven different seals? Now, in the ancient world, scrolls that would be sent from rulers and sent out would be sealed, and they would often have a seal, and sometimes more than one, because occasionally they would have to be read by people along the way. So they would be sealed, and you could open a portion, and another seal would be there, and you could open another portion. Seven seals is incredible. But there are seven seals, and at this point in the reading, six of them have been broken. Those first six are the things that we probably have seen in the movies. The, the riders of the, of the apocalypse, have you ever seen the Four Horsemen and heard about that? It's in music and media and movies all the time, uh, especially in these last few years where we've had so many movies about apocalyptic theme. But that's where the Four Horsemen are and where so much terrible persecution takes off. But this is right near the end of the last seal to be broken. And there's a pause in heaven, a period of quiet after this experience John speaks of. And the only thing that can be heard is the angel saying, woe, oh, woe to those for the seventh seal is about to be opened. This is right in the midst of where the world, as it is telling us, is going through tremendous trauma, unlike ever seen in the world before, the scriptures tell us. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of trauma in the world, and there has been for 2,000 plus years, actually as long as humanity has existed. The world has existed in trauma, in problems such as pestilence and drought and war and all the things spoken of in here. So it's very frightening to think that something could be worse 
than all of that combined, and this is what is prophesied here. So this passage of Scripture in which John is speaking his truth is very hard for us to hear. It's his vision. Does it speak knowledge? Of a kind, certainly. Can we use it in our own lives? Not in direct ways, but it re calls for us, as I said last Sunday, the importance of understanding the glory of heaven, the glory of God. It surpasses all our ability to understand. Our worship that we do in each and every Sunday is in, united with that which we read of in heaven. That's how we understand that to be through the Trinitarian understanding of God. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father participate in a relationship with each other that is united by love, and we are invited into that relationship. We are connected with our God through our understanding of the love of God for us and our love for God. We are brought together. These words may be very challenging to you if you read Revelations. You may wonder, why bother? My friend did. I don't know. I haven't seen him in years and years and years. For all I know, he, he now holds faith, or maybe he continues as a skeptic. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus says in his own voice, he says, I am the good shepherd. I speak truth. And understand, not everybody is going to hear that truth, and certainly not automatically, right away. I heard the truth of the Savior for many years and did not believe myself. There's a time in life where sometimes we find ourselves challenged and where we need to know what is and what is not true. It is so difficult to speak of truth today. 2,000 years ago, they were looking for truth, and they had Jesus right there before them speaking truth to them, and they did not hear, at least not right away. Even those closest to him didn't hear him clearly, it seems, for they continued to doubt. Even the day of resurrection, they continued to doubt. Even some on the day when Jesus was ascending to heaven, there still were some with doubts in their heart. So we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. We have the word of God before us, we hear it. We hear it read on Sundays. If you read it at home, you're reading it and hearing it. But you need to truly listen in a way that requires us to set aside all of the things in our heart that causes us to turn from the truth. And one of them is hearing something we just don't want to hear. Sometimes Jesus speaks words to us we simply do not want to hear because it causes us to realize something about ourselves. We cannot be unto ourselves everything that we need. Those around us, those closest to us that love us and care for us, cannot be everything unto us that we need. All of us need much more than what we can gain in this earthly life that we have just as we are. We need what is offered to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. The need the absolute need we have for what Jesus offers is what many people have the hardest time getting over. They have a hard time getting by that and hearing that truth because we assume that it must come at an enormous cost, that we must sacrifice our lives, or that we have to be doing such good in the world that it catches the attention of others, that we can never be, you know, good enough to earn the love of God. That's how Martin Luther felt, by the way. Martin Luther felt that way. So John Wesley, so did many of the great people of history who we think about when we talk about specific days in the year. But they eventually realize something that is absolutely critical, that the hardest truth, perhaps, to receive and understand that gets us by, that allows us to hear the good shepherd's voice is to realize that all we need to do is listen. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing special we have to offer. We come as we are, the good, the bad, the ugly, and we're loved. It's surrendering that understanding that somehow we have to control that, 
that we have to know, that we have to have a, you know, a lightning bolt experience or that we have to have Jesus appear and explain it to us. It's when we let go of all of that and realize the gentle and quiet voice of Christ comes into our hearts and our minds when we quiet ourselves and recognize our absolute dependency on what it is he has to offer, and that's life. And that's life, yes, and eternal life, but just as importantly for many of us anyway, right now, life in the living right this moment. Jesus said, I've come that they might live and that they might live abundantly. That's a truth, friends. That's a truth. And it may be hard to hear because we think it's too easy. But it wasn't easy to gain that truth. But it is easy to receive that truth. All you have to do is open your hearts. Open your hearts to God and say, come in. I'm ready. I've gone at this long enough myself all my life. I relied on my own reason. I relied on the, 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 all the things that I depended upon, all the things in my life that I thought were so sure, so certain. And now, dear Lord, I realize that all I've ever really needed was you. That, friends, is all it takes. And it changes your life. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. This is a joyful song, so let's sing it joyfully. I have a little bit more to say about revelations. I'll wrap it up next week. I didn't have quite time to get to some of the things I wanted to cover, so I'll finish the series next week uh, on the book of Revelations. I want to wish you all a wonderful day. May God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you richly, my friends. May you know the grace and peace and life that comes from Jesus Christ. It is a life-giving message.
that we hold, you hold in your hearts. It's a life-giving message. It breathes life into our life every single day. If only we will receive it. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult to hear. It's even more difficult, it seems, to live. But the truth, my friends, is Jesus lifts the burden from our shoulders. As he said, it is as if you take on the load with me and I will carry it for you. Join with me, he calls us to. For his burden, he says, is light. He will lift from you your burdens. He will indeed wipe every tear from your eye if you allow it. So now, may you know the joys of Jesus Christ and the blessings of our God. May we go in peace. God bless you all. Take care, and happy Mother's Day again.